All right, hi everybody. My name is Corey Hart. I'm an education specialist with Fish and Wildlife. And this is part two of a four-part series called Scat and Tracks. And what we're doing is we're, today we're going to be focusing on bobcat. We're going to be talking all about bobcat, uh, kind of the habitat they like, a little bit about uh, their biology. And we're going to get you pumped up to go out and try to find some tracks around your home or your schoolyard. Uh, before we do that, though, we're going to talk a little bit about the Fish and Wildlife Department. Uh, last, last episode, we talked a little bit about our mission. Uh, now I would like to discuss uh, the departments and the divisions we have within, because Fish and Wildlife Department is responsible for a lot of different things. Uh, and we have a lot of staff working with us uh, to, to complete our mission. Uh, and we break that off into five main divisions. Uh, the division I work for is our outreach division. We're responsible for education, uh, the website, Facebook, press releases, anything kind of outreach related. Uh, then we have our law enforcement division or warden service. And the warden service is responsible for law enforcement as well as search and rescue and things like that. So they're the people that would go out and address poaching violations, they'd check your fishing license, and if you get lost, they come out and help you out and get you out of the woods. And we have our fisheries division. So fisheries are responsible for fish. So they go out and monitor our waterways. And they also operate five fish hatchery stations that we have across Vermont that are responsible for stocking. Uh, so they actually raise fish in what are referred to as fish farms, but are basically, or fish hatcheries, but are basically a fish farm. And then we have our wildlife division. And wildlife division is responsible for things like deer, moose, as well as some of our smaller animals. Uh, our last and final division is perhaps one of our most important, uh, and it's our administration division. Uh, not only do they think, do things like licensing, but they also help to tie all of the other divisions together. And they do a lot of work behind the scenes to help, us keep, help to keep us all functioning. Uh, and they do with things like finance and all, all of those things we don't usually think of. Uh, but now that we talked a little bit about the Fish and Wildlife Department, you're here mainly, I'm guessing, to learn about bobcat. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So with me, I have a bobcat pelt. Bobcat are actually one of my favorite animals that we have in Vermont. And the reason for that is they're all over Vermont, but we rarely see them. And that's because of how they are. So they don't like to be seen. And because they don't like to be seen, we're not really going to see them much. They're a very evasive animal. Uh, they like to stay away from humans, uh, and they'll stay away from, from us, uh, which makes it very difficult to, f to find them. Uh, mainly, the way we actually look for bobcat is through things like scat, tracks, and that's how we get an idea of where they are. We might also set up cameras in the woods that allow us to photograph them when they're not, so we don't have to be there, we can just aut set up these automatic cameras called trail cams. Uh, but first and foremost, there's another critter out in the woods that we often mis or can, people can mistake bobcat for, and that is the Canada lynx. Canada lynx and bobcat look very similar. The way we actually tell them apart, well, there's a couple ways we can tell them apart, uh, but one of the most common ones is on their ear tufts. So they have these tufts that come off their ear, whereas bobcat have these small little ears. A Canada lynx has these big tufts that come off their ears. They also have really big paws. So bobcat, while their paws are larger than a house cat, their paws really aren't that big. They're only about this big or so. A Canada lynx has a much larger paw, and the paws are actually so much larger on a Canada lynx because they live in the northern climates. And those big paws act like snowshoes for them, whereas a bobcat might actually sink into the snow, Canada lynx are going to be able to actually walk up on top of the snow. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is Canada lynx are actually endangered in Vermont. We do have some populations of them, uh, but bobcat, on the other hand, are widespread across Vermont. When it comes to bobcat, one of the most important things uh, that we do as a department in terms of management is we focus a lot on habitat. Because bobcat love to travel. They're not like a rabbit, whereas a cottontail rabbit or species like that uh, doesn't need much. So it doesn't go very far. Bobcat are what's known as a wanderer. They have a really far home range. And they'll wander really far. And in order to, to do that, they need connected habitat. 
if there was a subdivision put in the middle of their habitat, that would cut them off. And that doesn't work. So what we do is we help to conserve a lot of properties so we can keep their habitat nice and tied together, which gives that, those bobcats plenty of room to roam. One of the biggest areas we have in Vermont that has a lot of bobcat and plenty of room for them to roam is the Green Mountain National Forest Range. It is miles and miles of woods. It has plenty of room for them to roam. It also has the habitat they like. So bobcat like a wide range of habitat, but they really like ledges. Air, uh, ledges, rock ledges, things like that are great spots for their den sites. Uh, in those mountainous areas, they do really well. Uh, and they also like areas kind of like where we're standing right now, kind of a mix of hardwoods and coniferous. So coniferous, for those of you that don't know, uh, is kind of a fancy word for a pine tree or area, or green trees that stay green all year long. They kind of like those type of habitats. So what do bobcats eat? Well, they eat a lot of different things. Uh, they eat things like voles, mice, but they also go after some bigger animals as well. And a lot of people don't realize this, uh, but bobcats will go after deer, uh, especially during the winter time when there's really deep snow and it makes it hard for deer to move around. Uh, bobcats will go after them during those type of uh, scenarios. Uh, if a bobcat gets an animal like a deer or a larger animal, what they actually do is they store it. Uh, so much like how uh, we might put our food in our refrigerator at home, bobcat will actually store their animals. So they might put it underneath a log or, or stick it somewhere. Uh, and it used to be that that worked really well for bobcats. They were able to store their food for long periods at a time and come back to it over three or four days, especially if they had a large deer. Uh, but now, as we coyotes and animals like that have grown more abundant in Vermont, it's a lot harder, harder for bobcats to actually store their deer or store animals that they catch because as they store it, other animals smell that and they're going to go after it. Now we're going to talk a little bit about management. Uh, we actually have a very highly regulated hunting and trapping season for bobcat across Vermont. Uh, typically in a normal year, only about 20 to 30 bobcat are taken across Vermont. Uh, that's either through hunting or through trapping. Uh, a lot of people don't realize this, but we actually used to have a bounty on bobcats in Vermont. Uh, and their bounty was actually in place up until the 70s. And what a bounty was is people would actually get paid to harvest bobcats. Well, things have changed, especially with our management principles of a lot of different animals. Uh, and now we actually manage for bobcat. There's no longer a bounty on them. Uh, they're actually a great species uh, that we spend a lot of time working with habitat on. Uh, the most important thing for a, a bobcat is making sure that it has plenty of room to roam. Uh, that's the most crucial thing out there. So the best way we can actually benefit bobcat is to go out and make sure we can serve as much land as possible, focusing on wide tracks and connecting those together. If I have a really big piece of land over there, and a really piece of big land over there, and a subdivision in the middle or a lot of houses, that doesn't work. I need to be able to connect those two pieces of land somehow. And that's where Fish and Wildlife comes in, or other conservation agencies. We spend a lot of time figuring out how to make that happen and make it so that those bobcats and other animals that need areas to roam can get from point A to point B easily and safely. So we've gone out, we've actually identified the proper ha habitat for bobcat. So we're kind of on a mountainous area. We've got some nice uh, pine trees, things like that around us. It's kind of fairly open. Uh, but there's also good spots for them to hide and for them to hunt as well, to go after things like mice, voles, critters like that. And after some searching, we were able to actually come out and we found some bobcat tracks. And if you have uh, a cat at home or you've seen a cat uh, kind of walking around town, you've probably take, seen a look at their tracks before. And bobcat tracks look very similar to a house cat's tracks. Whereas you're not going to see that front claw when they're, those front claws when they're walking. And you just kind of see uh, the paws. Uh, but the only way to actually ID a bobcat track versus a house cat track is actually the sheer size of it. And you see, looking at it, if I was to put my hand right next to this one, and that's my hand. I mean, it's still pretty big, but that's, that's a fairly big track. Whereas if it was a house cat track, the track itself would look uh, fairly identical, but it'd be much, much smaller. It'd be about half the size of that. And what we'll do is we're actually going to show you in a little bit some, tra some house cat tracks we actually saw on our drive-in that are noticeably smaller, uh, but look very similar. And that's kind of how you track, get them down, or figure it out. First you start, you get out there, look for the right habitat, 
and then you might find the tracks and you have to kind of figure it out a little bit. Uh, it might look very similar to several different species and through trial and error you'll figure out what it is. Uh, the more time you spend in the woods looking, the better you'll be good at track identification. Uh, it also always helps if you bring a track ID guide with you as well, because uh, that'll help you if you're not quite sure. Uh, you can uh, reference that and there's usually some good pointers and things like that in there as well. Uh, but now that I've found tracks, tracks are just one type of sign I'd be looking for with Bobcat. The other sign I would be focusing on is their scat. Right here I have some fake scat that I have with me because I wasn't fortunate enough today to find real scat, bobcat scat. But this is some fake bobcat scat. And it might look a little bit different depending on what the bobcat happened to eat. Sometimes you'll see things like hair and things like that in there as well. Uh, but for the most part it'll look similar to this. And as I said before, it's fairly rare for us to actually see bobcat when I'm out in the woods. Like if I was on a hike and I saw a bobcat, that'd be a very rare sighting. It just doesn't usually happen. But they're all over the woods. They just don't like to be seen. Just because I'm not seeing them doesn't mean they're not there and they're not abundant. Uh, if I go and look for them in other ways, so I look for tracks, scat, then I'll actually think you might realize that, wow, there are a lot of bobcat around here. I didn't realize there was bobcats near my house. Well, that's because they just don't want to be seen, but they're still there. Uh, what we're going to do now is similar to what we've done every week, is I want you to actually go out with your parent or guardian or your teacher and go actually look for bobcat sign. If you're at an area around your school, what I expect you're going to find is domesticated cat. Uh, but you may find actual bobcat. It's possible. You'll find them in a lot of different settings. Uh, so first things first, as you go out there, well, you need to look for the right habitat. That might not be right on the back by the playground. Uh, it might mean we have to go on a little bit more of a walk to get to the, the appropriate habitat. Once I find that habitat, well, then we start searching. If I'm with a class and I'm walking, if we're on a trail, we all want to stay on the trail so we're not making much of an impact, right? You don't want to all start your own trail. But if we're not walking on a trail, it's actually important that we spread out. Because if I'm walking through the woods in an area where there isn't a trail and there's a bunch of us walking, what actually happens is we create a trail. And we don't want to do that because then it, it's going to look like to other people that a bunch of people walk there. And you want it to look like nobody's been there before. Uh, so when we walk through the woods with a group of people, we actually like to spread out and it's less of an impact on the forest. And if we're doing it that way, it allows us to actually have a better chance of finding those bobcat tracks that we're looking for. Uh, and remember, when you go out there to bring a notebook or bring a camera and, and photograph what you find or sketch it. Uh, next week, or next episode, we're going to be focusing on snowshoe hare.